a Living History production. This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello and welcome to Living History. I'm your host, Matt McLaughlin, and thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. In these very strange times with COVID and pandemics, we've had a lot of new listeners discover the podcast, and hopefully we've been providing some entertainment and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a bit of an escape from the perils of the world during this time. And it's always important in these uncertain times to look back and see what people did before us and how they came through difficult times. So hopefully Living History is playing its part in helping you to get through these uh, these uncertain times that we're currently living in. But we've seen lots of new listeners come to the podcast. In fact, we are rapidly approaching a million downloads for the podcast. So thank you so much for that. It's so gratifying that people want to hear what I've got to say. And so whether you're a listener who has been with us since the start or a newer listener, just thank you for joining us. And uh, I look forward to bringing you many more stories of history. Before we get started on today's episode, an announcement. I hope you've heard this before. I hope this isn't the first time you're hearing it. But Peter Hart, a great friend of the show, a wonderful historian, has written a book for us, for Living History. We are publishing it. It's the start of a new publishing venture. We've got lots of great books coming up in the future, and this is the one to kick it off. So Peter's written a wonderful book called The Gallipoli Evacuation, and this is a wonderful story about a chapter of Gallipoli we don't really know very much about, and the book's just fantastic. I've enjoyed editing and reading it, and Peter's done a wonderful job. So the book is now available to pre-order. And as a new publishing venture, pre-orders are very important to us. So if you're interested in reading the book, it would be wonderful if you could go and pre-order the book on our website. It'll be available in early September. You'll receive copies. Uh, But if you go and pre-order it now before the end of July, you will also receive and be able to download straight away a very special behind-the-scenes interview with Peter Hart. And this is all about his motivations for writing the book and how he went about doing it. The interview goes for about two hours. The key feature of it is that it includes audio excerpts from Gallipoli veterans telling their story in their own words. It's just remarkable to hear those voices echoing out decades later telling the story of what it was like to be at Gallipoli. So that's a wonderful addition if you order the book before the end of July. You will get that, be able to download it straight away. So go to our website, pre-order the book in either ebook or printed copy, and you can pay in a range of currencies, get it sent to you wherever you are in the world. The website is livinghistorytv.com. That website again, livinghistorytv.com. Get your hands on that book. I'm sure you will be glad that you did. Now, this week's episode of the podcast, no interview this week. It's just going to be me solo on the microphone because I did something on Anzac Day which was very, very well received. Because people couldn't visit battlefields, because they couldn't go to services on Anzac Day, I did a virtual tour of the battlefield of Gallipoli. We walked to the ground at Gallipoli. We walked Anzac Cove virtually uh, with the sound of my voice. And if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to it because I really enjoyed bringing it to you. And Gallipoli is just such a wonderful place to visit. And so it was very well received. One of the most popular downloads we've had for this entire season. So I thought I'd do it again. And this time we're going to move to the Western Front. We're going to visit the town of Ypres and we're going to walk the ground there on a virtual tour of the town of Ypres. Now, Actually, before I get started, I'm going to talk about the name because I, I, this is something that comes up all the time. I did a video on YouTube, which was about walking around the town of Ypres called Walking the, Walking the Battlefield of Ypres. And a lot of people contacted me to say I was getting the name wrong. So let's talk about the name of the town to begin with. So this is the town most famous for the battles in 1917, but there were five very large battles fought there during the war, during the First World War. So the name of the town. Okay, during the First World War, The British, for the sake of convenience, even though their sector of the Western Front stretched from France into Belgium, the British used the French names across the board. So in Belgium, they speak both French and Flemish. But during the war, the British, for the sake of convenience, for the sake of consistency, used nothing but the French names across the board. So what that means is towns in Belgium, the British were using the French names. So this town that we're talking about, Y-P-R-E-S, is how the British spelt it during the time, and they pronounced it Ypres. Now, I've got to say, a lot of people that contact me on on YouTube, particularly our friends in Britain, say that I'm getting the name wrong, that the, the name is actually pronounced Ypres. Um, that's completely wrong as well. Even in French, it's not Ypres. It's Ypres is the pronunciation in French, which was used during the First World War. The soldiers couldn't really get their tongues around that, so they called it Wipers, Y-P-R-E-S. That is the French name. But what I should say is that the town of Ypres is in 
Belgium in the Flemish speaking part. So the people who live in the town don't use the French spelling. They don't use the French name. They use the Flemish name, which is effectively Dutch. And the Dutch slash Flemish pronunciation and spelling, well, the spelling of the town is I-E-P-E-R and the pronunciation is Ipa. And so that is how local people call their town. And because I do a lot of tours over there, because I'm visiting it all the time, because I'm corresponding a lot with the people, I've fallen into the habit of using the name that the locals use when they're over there, which is Ipa. So throughout this podcast, you'll hear me refer to the town as Ipa, which is what the locals call it, which is how it's spelled. Uh, it's, it won't, I won't be using the archaic um, British French pronunciation of Ypres, but it's the same town. It's the same place. Uh, we all know it. It's a wonderful place to visit. So uh, I hope that uh, goes some way towards explaining the pronunciation, but I'll be using the, the, uh, the pronunciation the locals use, which is Ypres, during the course of this journey. So we're going to take a walk around the town. The town is a really wonderful place to visit. And once we're all able to travel again, I encourage you to get over to the battlefields, to go not just to France and the Somme region, but head north and go to Belgium and go to the area around Ypres. Now, why was Ypres, Ypres an important town during the First World War? Well, the reason basically was, is just coincidentally, it was the only town of any significance that hadn't been captured by the Germans. Some German troops did enter the town very early in 1914, uh, during the early stages of the war in 1914. Uh, they didn't uh, stay for very long, and that was the only time Germans set foot in the town during the First World War. So what we should remember about this region as well is that the, reg the reason the British joined the First World War was to protect Belgium. Belgium was neutral. The Germans invaded Belgium to get to France, and the British that was the reason they went to war, to protect neutral Belgium. So it was very important to the British that they defend whatever corner of Belgium was not in German hands. And the town of Ypres was really the only significant town that wasn't in German hands in Belgium. And so the British in particular determined that they were going to defend the town at all costs. And what it meant was that the Germans were able to push ahead on both sides of the town without actually capturing the town itself. So what this formed was a bulge in the line. The British line actually stuck out into the German line. And this is known in military circles as a salient. So the Ypres salient, the Ypres salient became a primary feature of the battlefield. And realistically, what the British should have done is they should have backed away. They should have pulled out of the town of Ypres, moved back and straightened their line. It would have been much better for them from a military point of view. But they didn't do that because they didn't want to give up the only significant town that they still held in Belgium. So it was, a, it was a source of pride to the British that they held on to the town of Ypres. But it created a salient, as I said, a bulge in the line. And salients are very difficult to defend because you can basically be fired on from three sides. And that's exactly what happened in the town of Ypres. So we often describe the landscape around Ypres. It's very flat in this region of Belgian Flanders. But what there is is a, a series of ridges, which what we say is form a sickle shape around the town. So if you imagine the handle of the sickle, heading south to north towards Ypres and then curving east around Ypres. Uh, and that was the blade of the sickle. Uh, and this, these ridges, the Messine Ridge to the south and the Passchendaele and Broodseend ridges to the east uh, were the scenes of this famous fighting in the Ypres salient. So that's a little bit of the geography. Gra grab a map and have a look and see, uh, see the town, see, uh, see where it is in Belgium. It's not too far from the coast and it was a very important part of the line. There were lots of battles around this area and lots of people were killed. Because of the nature of the salient, it's a very compact area. And so about a million men were killed or wounded during the course of the war in the Ypres salient. Just horrific slaughter in this area. And most famously around the town of Passchendaele. So just a just absolute slaughter in this region of the salient as it's known. There were a number of salients along the Western Front, dozens in fact, during the course of the war. But when veterans refer to the salient, they mean the Ypres salient, the area around Ypres. And it was an absolute killing field during the war, but because it was so compact, it's a wonderful area to visit today because there are so many sites in such a small area. And the town of Ypres itself has really embraced its wartime heritage in a wonderful way. Most of the people in the town speak English as well as Flemish and some French. Uh, so it's a very welcoming town. It's very compact. The battlefields are very easy to visit. So it's a town I love going back to. And during the war, the town was completely destroyed. It was absolutely obliterated from the face of the earth. And painstakingly after the war, it's been rebuilt. Interestingly, Winston Churchill, after the war, did not want the town rebuilt. He wanted the entire town preserved in its ruined state as a memorial to the soldiers who died in the area. And Winston Churchill had served as an officer during the war in the area around Ypres. So like many British veterans, 
he had a big soft spot for the place and and wanted it preserved as a memorial. The the local people of Ypres though thought differently and they wanted to rebuild the town, which they did. But it wasn't until the 1960s that they finished reconstruction of the town. So when you're there today and you walk the streets, as we're going to do on this virtual tour, you will see written on the facades of the buildings where you would normally expect dates from the 17th and 18th centuries on these old buildings. What you will see instead is 1923, 1924 dates from the 1920s when these buildings were rebuilt. So it's a really wonderful town. I really encourage you, if you get a chance to get to the Western Front, absolutely include Ypres. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Now let's begin a walking tour around Ypres. We're going to start our tour of Ypres in the main square, the uh, Great Market as it's known, or the Groat Markt in Flemish. Now I should say that uh, I'm getting a lot of this information from this tour from my book, Walking with the Anzacs which came out many years ago, but is still in print and I've updated it. So if you want to join me on this uh, virtual tour with a book in front of you, then grab my book, Walking with the Anzacs, and also use it uh, as a guide when you're traveling around the battlefields, because uh, particularly, obviously, for the Australian sites, it's a guide to the Australian battlefields on the Western Front. Uh, And uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here, you can find in the pages of the book. So we're in the main square of Ypres, the Groat Markt, the Great Market, and still every Saturday they have a market here on the square as they've done for centuries in the town. So the nature of the products that they sell has obviously changed over the years, um, but this has always been the scene of commerce in the town. And the town has a very interesting story when it comes to commerce and industry because this area of Flanders was famous for its cloth production, uh, particularly in the uh, heading back centuries, heading back into the 15th, 14th centuries even. They, They produce wonderful cloth in this area. And the main building on the square is known as the Cloth Hall. Uh, And the Cloth Hall is the wonderful, beautiful building that you see in the main square of Ypres that is so famous in both wartime and modern photos of the town. It's the most iconic building in the entire town. And the Cloth Hall demonstrates a very interesting connection with Britain because Britain, from the earliest days, from really the 13th century onwards, Britain produced a very high quality of wool. And this wool was sent to Flanders and turned into wonderful cloth, which was then sold back to Britain and, uh, and sent throughout all parts of Europe. And that made this area of Flanders very, very wealthy. The other town that was very wealthy in the region from the cloth trade is Bruges, which is uh, not far down the road from Ypres and is, uh, is, is quite a lovely town as well. It, Bruges was spared during both wars, so it's a, it's a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful town because it, uh, it was not destroyed, unlike most towns in this region. Uh, Ypres, unfortunately, did not uh, did not survive the war, the First World War in particular, uh, and uh, all of the buildings around you now in the uh, in the main square here in the Groat Markt uh, have been rebuilt in the 1920s, including the Cloth Hall as well. The Cloth Hall the construction was not finished until 1962, uh, and so when you look at the Cloth Hall now, you can see that they've retained parts of the building that were still structurally sound from the war. So there are still columns, there are still panels in that building that were there during the war, and they are absolutely scarred with shell fire. So this whole building was destroyed, just a skeleton remained, but now today you can still see scars all over the surface of the building from fighting there in the First World War, and I absolutely love that. It's I always love these tangible connections with the war. So whenever I'm in Ypres, I always go up to that building and always run my hands over the rough surface and touch the, 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 the scrapes and the dings and the, and the shell holes in the surface of the of the cloth hall, because there's no there's no more tangible connection with the history, with bringing the history to life, than to run your hands over the surface of the damaged building. So it's a, a really wonderful place to begin a tour of Ypres. Uh, the tourist information office is in the in the uh, the cloth hall. That's where you can go and find out all information about where to visit on the battlefields. But also, most importantly, there's a wonderful museum in there called in the In Flanders Fields Museum, named after the famous John McRae poem which was written nearby in 1915 and so it's a really wonderful place to begin your journey the the museum was upgraded a few years ago and it it went from being a a collection of artifacts which I really kind of enjoyed it was a very somber very haunting very confronting museum and now it's a bit more modern and they they use technology to tell the story it's still a great place though to begin a walk around the town of Ypres Uh, and Ypres is a lovely walking town it's easy to get around it's flat it's compact it's a really lovely place to walk. So begin your tour there, uh, visit the museum, and then we'll after that we will leave the Cloth Hall and we'll walk across the main square down towards our next destination, which is the famous Menin Gate. As we leave the square and walk down the street that connects the square to the famous Menin Gate, you pass by a number of shops that sell military items, the famous chocolate shops of, of Belgium and particularly Flanders that sell 
chocolates in the shape of military helmets from the First World War, souvenirs. The town really does embrace its wartime heritage in a, in a wonderful way. You also go past restaurants and pubs, great food and beer in this area. If you're a beer drinker, you will enjoy your visit to Ypres very, very much. As we walk down the street, only a few hundred metres, we come to the, Me- the Menon Gate, which towers over the eastern end of the town. Now, the story of the Menon Gate... Ypres is a ramparted city. There are ramparts that run around the, the, the town. And during the First World War, these were really the only protection provided uh, to the town, the, the massive ramparts. And there, were, there was no gate at, uh, at Menon Gate during the, uh, during the war. It's called, it's called the Menon Gate because this is the road that leads to the town of Menon, which is uh, to the east of Ypres. And there was, no, there was no physical presence here. There was simply a gap in the ramparts. And soldiers used to march out this eastern end of the town out into the killing fields of the Western Front. And because of that, as they walked through this gap in the ramparts, that was often the last view they had of the town of Ypres before they headed out into the battlefields. And of course, many thousands of them never returned. So after the war, they decided this was a very appropriate place to build a memorial to the soldiers who had fought and died in the Ypres salient during the war. I should mention what was next to the gate is a, a small connect, connection with Australia because there were two stone lions that are the symbol of Ypres that guarded the, the gap in the ramparts, which was known as the Menon Gate. And those two stone lions were very badly knocked around by shellfire during the war. And after the war, they were donated to the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. And so those two battered stone lions now guard the entrance to the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. And in 2017, the centenary of the battles, of uh, the main battles in the Ypres salient, the, the huge battles of 1917, the Australian government loaned for the year those two lions to the town of Ypres. So they sent them back and they were displayed on two plinths outside the Menon Gate. Uh, after 2017, they were returned to Canberra uh, and two replicas were paid for by Australia and put back on those plinths. So the two stone lions that are depicted in a number of photos of soldiers marching out into the battlefield, still stand uh, and guard the Menon Gate as they did during the war. Now, the gate itself, as I said, this was considered the most appropriate spot where soldiers left the town and walked out to the battlefields after the war. This, this was a great spot to commemorate those soldiers who'd paid the ultimate price. And the Menon Gate is a beautiful archway. It is part mausoleum and part victory arch. So it encompasses both aspects of both victory and mourning, and it's, it really does it quite wonderfully. And the arch runs across the road, traffic drives underneath it every day, and it, it faces out to the killing fields of the Ypres salient, a really wonderful spot. The key, the most significant feature of this gate, of this memorial, are the names inscribed on the memorial. Now, at the end of the First World War, the Imperial War Graves Commission, as it was known at the time, made a very forward-thinking decision. They determined that every man who'd been killed in the war should be commemorated individually. So most other nations weren't doing this. The Germans and the French, they weren't commemorating soldiers individually. They were piling bodies into mass graves and simply marking the the, the name of a soldier who they assumed was buried there. The British decided they weren't going to do this. They were going to record every man by name. So I should say British and Commonwealth. When I say British, I mean the Commonwealth nations as well. So they wanted to record every man who was killed in the war individually. And so that would either be on a grave for men who were buried in cemeteries, or if the soldier had no known grave, as so many tens of thousands of soldiers did, they were going to be recorded on big memorials like this one. And so that's what the Menon Gate does. The Menon Gate records the names of missing from the Ypres salient. So these are men who have no known grave. So the important thing to point out is there's, there's about 54,000 names on the Menon Gate. The important thing to remember is these men are not all missing out in the fields. Probably half of them are actually buried in cemeteries, but we just don't know which soldier is in which grave. So when you go to the cemeteries, particularly in this area, you will see thousands of headstones which bear the inscription, known unto God, which just means that we don't know which soldier lies in that grave. So if you stand in front of a grave that has an unknown inscription on it, what that means is we don't know who the soldier is on that grave, but this man's name is recorded on the Menon Gate if you're in the Ypres salient. Uh, or other memorials in the area that record the missing from 1917. So not every missing soldier, not every so- about half of the soldiers on the Menon Gate actually have a grave. We just don't know which man is in which grave. So it's interesting, the names on the memorial. So 50, about 54,000 British and Commonwealth names. About 6,000 of these are Australian for our Australian listeners. Uh, and there are other nations as well, South Africa, uh, Canada, 
Interestingly, um, India is, is well represented on the memorial. An interesting one that's not there, though, is New Zealand. There are no New Zealand names on the Menengate Memorial. New Zealand chose to build memorials at each significant battlefield where New Zealanders fell, uh, such as Messine and at Passchendaele and at other places around the Western Front, and this is where New Zealand names are recorded. Now, in spite of the immense size of the Menengate, it was never going to be large enough to hold the sheer number of names that belonged to men missing from the salient. The, such was the, the rate of death here. And so the Menon Gate contains about 54,000 names, but they, they put a, a, a cutoff point up to the 15th of August, 1917. So only British men killed before the 15th of August, 1917 are recorded on the Menon Gate. So what that means, interestingly, is the most famous battle, which was the Third Battle of Ypres, which took place from July onwards to October, uh, November, 1917, most of the men who are missing from that battle, the battle that resulted in the most missing soldiers, those men are not recorded on the Menon Gate if they are British. Um, British men killed in those battles um, and from the 15th of August 1917 onwards are recorded on a huge memorial at Tynecott Cemetery out on the Passchendaele battlefield. So there's about another 35,000 names on that battlefield memorial out at Passchendaele. Australians are the exception to the rule. As, as I said in my book, we're wanting to defy British order to the last. So all Australians killed at any time during the war in the Ypres salient are recorded on the Menon Gate. So that means there's about 6,000 Australians, all, all categorised by their battalion and then alphabetically, as is the way of these memorials. And so it's a really wonderful sight. And just something I wanted to, to mention about the Australians here is that there's no Victoria Cross winners recorded on the memorial. In, but in terms of other bravery awards, it's quite extraordinary the number of people recorded here who received awards. So I'm just going to go through and, and point out, so these are just the Australians, the awards that are listed next to men's names on the Men and Gate Memorial. So three of the soldiers there won the Distinguished Service Order, which is the second highest award after the Victoria Cross. 22 received the Distinguished Conduct Medal, which is the second highest award for non-officers. One soldier earned the Military Cross twice, which is an MCN bar, Two soldiers earned the Military Cross and the Military Medal. 21 earned the Military Cross. Four earned the Military Medal twice, which is the Military Medal and Bar. And an astonishing 93 won the Military Medal. So it just shows the full range of awards that are listed next to men on the Men and Gate. Of course, by 1917, a lot of these men had been fighting for several years and had had ample opportunity to demonstrate their bravery. So that's why there's just so many awards there. And there are numerous wonderful stories of soldiers, tragic stories of soldiers who are recorded on the Menon Gate. Probably the, the one that strikes a chord uh, most with Australians is the Seabrook brothers from Sydney. And there's two Seabrook names recorded on the Menon Gate. They're Privates George and Theo Seabrook, who were aged 25 and 24. Uh, and they uh, were killed on the same day, the 20th of September. George and Theo Seabrook were marching into the Battle of Menon Road uh, on the 20th of September, 1917, and a shell exploded and killed them both. Um, and their brother, William, he was a 21-year-old. He was an officer. He was a second lieutenant. And he'd been wounded, uh, and he was lying in a hospital when his two brothers were killed. And he had not heard the news that his brothers had been killed when he died of his wounds the following day. So in two days, three brothers were killed, and two of them, George and Theo, were recorded on the Menon Gate. So that's one to look for. If you go up the stairs to the left, they're just on the left as you go up. Uh, onto the Menon Gate. So that's a tragic, tragic story. So two, three brothers killed within two days of each other. And William Seabrook is buried uh, at Lysenhock Cemetery out, uh, out near Popperinga. So you can visit his grave as well if you head out, uh, out in that direction. So that's just one of the countless, countless tragic tales on the Menon Gate. So when you go there, spend some time, look at the names, explore the memorial. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's moving. It's tragic. It's a, a really one of the highlights of visit to the Western Front. And in terms of highlights, there's nothing better than what happens at night time. In the daytime, it's wonderful to visit the Menon Gate, but at night time, something extraordinary happens. And so, as I said, traffic drives under the memorial, but at 8 p.m. every night, the police come and block the road off. They stop cars from driving there, and a wonderful service occurs that has occurred there since 1928. The memorial opened in 1927, and in 1928, the local people began doing something extraordinary buglers from the Ypres Fire Brigade come out and they play the last post in bugle chorus. And the sounds of the last post echoing around this wonderful memorial are just haunting. It is by far the most important service that takes place regularly on the Western Front. And the last post at the Menon Gate is now iconic and thousands and thousands of people 
turn up every night to see this service, particularly during the centenary years from 2014 to 2018. The, the place was absolutely packed, but it still remains so. In the times I've been there since then, it's still been packed every night. And they perform this in all weather. Every day they perform the service, rain, hail or shine. The only time they didn't perform the service was during the four years of German occupation during World War II. And they began the service again on the day the town was liberated. There was still fighting going on in parts of Ypres and they began performing the memorial service under the damaged Menon Gate on the day the town was liberated in 1944. So it's just extraordinary. What I say to people all the time when I'm there is if this was a service they were performing in honour of Belgium troops, in, in honour of their own troops, it would be extraordinary. But it's not. It's for British and Commonwealth troops that fell in the area. So absolutely include that on any visit to the Western Front. It's just extraordinary. And even during COVID, even during lockdown when we couldn't gather together, one bugler would still go out and perform on his own with no crowd and he would still play the last post. So the town of Ypres has continued to honour these soldiers even during a pandemic. It's just extraordinary. It's a wonderful thing to go and attend. So make sure you do uh, when you visit the, bat- the battlefields of the Western Front. If you're on one of my tours, a Matt McLaughlin battlefield tour, I know the people that organise the service very well. So we make sure that if you have some connection to the war, you can also lay a wreath. Uh, on uh, during that service and we always select a couple of passengers on the tour to lay a wreath on behalf of the group so it's just an extraordinary service so so certainly don't miss that one once we've finished exploring the Menon Gate we're going to climb the stairs and we're going to go up onto the ramparts where our tour continues the ramparts run around the eastern and southern ends of the town they used to ring the town completely uh, but uh, over the years uh, they were demolished and and as, as the town expanded and the ramparts are gone except for the eastern and southern parts of the town. And the ramparts were built um, in the 17th century by the French military architect Vauban. This was the northernmost outpost of the French Empire during the 17th century, and so they built ramparts to protect the town, as they did with a lot of towns in the area. They're they're not an unknown feature. Um, But today the ramparts are really an elevated parkland which extends along the eastern and southern sides of the town. It's really beautiful at all times of the year to walk down there, particularly in summer, in a summer evening when it's... You know, when, it, when the sun goes down very late in the evening and it's warm and it's a lovely place to have a stroll through the trees and the parklands along the ramparts. And historic as well because you're walking along those 17th century ramparts. You can see gun emplacements. You can see places cut into the ramparts for defence. You can, you can really tell the story of the, the history of Ypres and the, the very strong military connection the town has always had. And as you stroll along the ramparts, there are little passageways and little doors. A couple of years ago, the town, townspeople of Ypres built a brewery in the, uh, in the ramparts. So combining their love of beer with the history of, the, uh, of wartime Ypres, they built a brewery in the ramparts. And during the war, the ramparts were really the only part of the town that was legitimately safe from shellfire because they're massive, they're thick. They were the only part of the town, effectively, that was safe from shellfire. And so headquarters were built there, hospitals... Um, billets for the soldiers, communication centres, so that the, the little rooms and little tunnels inside the ramparts were a hive of activity uh, during the war. It's often said that uh, the, the great generals like Plumer um, occupied the, uh, the the ramparts, but their their headquarters are actually several miles behind the front line. They weren't going to be in the front line. But um, but more specific uh, headquarters such as brigade headquarters and, and battalion headquarters were often located in the ramparts as well as aid posts, ammunition supplies, dumps for all sorts of equipment. Uh, so the, the ramparts, as I said, were a hive of activity. And one of the things I like to do when I visit the area is, again, knowing the local people of Ypres, if you come on a tour with me uh, individually, we, um, we can get access to some of those rooms, including a room that I suspect was used by John Monash uh, in 1916 and 1917 when he was, uh, when he was a, a, a commander before he took over the Australian Corps. Uh, so there's a very strong Australian connection there. Also, a newspaper called the Wipers Times, a satirical newspaper, uh, began uh, and was uh, printed in, a, in, a, in an old printing press in a room in the ramparts. So um, if you're fortunate enough to get access to some of these rooms, it's really quite extraordinary, the history that is revealed there. But the ramparts are a wonderful spot to stroll, especially on a summer's evening, just around the, the town and, and, and take in just the, the history. I, I always like walking there and just thinking about what it means, thinking about obviously not too many soldiers would have been strolling around there during the wartime with the risk of shell fire, but the number of soldiers that lived and, and worked in around the ramparts during the war, it's a, it's a really lovely addition to the town. And as we keep walking along the ramparts, after a couple of kilometres, we come to the southern edge of the town and there is another gate there, this one much smaller than the Menon Gate, but, but also very significant, less well-known than the Menon Gate, but also significant. 
So this one faces south. This is on the main road south out of the town and is known as Lil Gate. And it's called Lil Gate because it, the road goes to the major French town of Lille, not far across the border down in France. So the Lil Gate is a, a beautiful old ornate gate marking the, the, the road that heads down to Lille. Now, I mentioned before that the Menon Gate was the route most frequently used by troops to access the front line. But the problem with the Menon Gate during the war is it was very exposed to shell fire because it faced due east, which was where the Germans were. So the Germans could pour fire into the, uh, into the, the Menon Gate as troops left. And they knew that it was a significant spot for troops to assemble. So that's why the Menon Gate was a very dangerous place to be. So the Lille Gate was often used to ferry troops out of the town because they could then march south out of the town. They weren't directly exposed to shell fire and then they could loop around and, and head east out to, the, out to the battlefields. But I should point out that there was no place in the Ypres salient that was safe. And there's a roundabout you can see from Lille Gate as you, as you stand on the top of the gate and look, look out in the distance. You can see a roundabout only 100 metres or so from the, from the gate and that was known as Shrapnel Corner during the war because of the huge amount of shrapnel fire that was poured down there during the war. So the Lille Gate is a, a lovely spot to visit and again to remember the soldiers that were there. Walk down from the Lille Gate. We're going to go down now under the gate and on the wall of the side of the gate there's something very, very special. Um, there's some original grave markers from the Imperial War Graves Commission uh, which marked the graveyards that that pilgrims would come and visit after the war. So Ypres was a very big pilgrimage town. A lot of people would come over from England in particular to visit the graves of their lost sons in the cemeteries in the salient. And these original markers on the Lil Gate were for those pilgrims so they could find these cemeteries. And some of these cemeteries don't even exist anymore. So it's really lovely to have that connection with not just the wartime history, but also those years immediately after the war which were the scenes of, of tragedy and sadness as pilgrims came over to find the graves of their lost sons. As a, as a father myself, I, I can only begin to imagine what it must have been like to visit a graveyard and, and walk those rows looking for the name of your lost son and then eventually finding him in a grave there. It must have been absolutely heartbreaking. Um, so those, uh, those, grave, those, uh, those signposts pointing to the cemeteries, just a wonderful connection with that history. We're now going to walk down a little bit past the little gate and there's a left turn and there's a sign to Ramparts Cemetery. And we're going to go into the cemetery um, and really enjoy the time here in what is one of the most beautiful cemeteries on the Western Front. Now, Ramparts Cemetery was the first Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery I ever visited, the first time I went to the battlefields, back in, I think, the early 2000s, so about 20 years ago. And it's still one of my favourite cemeteries on the Western Front. Favourite's an odd word, but... I mean, they're very sad places, but you also do feel a real affinity with them. They're, they're, they're some, every cemetery tells a story, and this one is just such a beautiful location. I mean, for the poor men that lie here, they certainly do lie in a, just a beautiful place. It's, it's just such a lovely spot. There's a moat out the front. The water uh, of the moat runs past it. There's weeping willows. It's just a, a gorgeous, gorgeous spot, one of the most beautiful cemeteries on the Western Front. And it's a real, it's a genuine battlefield cemetery. You'll have heard me talk about this before, the nature of different types of cemeteries, whether they're battlefield cemeteries or hospital cemeteries, communal cemeteries, concentration cemeteries. There's a whole range of different types of cemeteries that were built either during or after the war. This is a great example of a battlefield cemetery. This cemetery was built under fire, in a hurry. Men were buried here simply for convenience to get them out of the way while shells were falling all around. So I, every time I stand here, I imagine those burial parties working at night hurriedly to bury as many men as they could before the sun came up and they were caught by shell fire. So obviously a horrific job, uh, one that was not, uh, not popular with the men, but, but necessary work that had to be done. And that's reflected in the nature of the cemetery. A lot of the, the rows are not particularly neat. There's a, lot of, there's a few isolated graves. You can see that it, this cemetery was created in a hurry. And it was actually begun um, by the French, actually began the cemetery uh, in uh, 1914 uh, when they were occupying this part of Belgium, but it was taken over by the British in 1915 uh, and the British used the cemetery up until the end of the war in 1918. So there's now about 200 burials in Rampart Cemetery. It's not particularly big, um, but it is a gorgeous place. And so again, for our Australians, there's 11 Australians buried here, um, all of them identified um, including six men who were killed when a shell hit the Second Division headquarters in the Ramparts on the 29th of October 1917. There's also some Maori pioneers buried here for our New Zealand uh, comrades, and the Maori pioneers are a wonderful story, particularly at New Zealand. Uh, at New Zealand, I'm sorry, at Gallipoli, the New Zealanders are well represented. So, 
the Maori pioneers, particularly a place like Walker's Ridge Cemetery at Gallipoli, there's a number of Maori pioneers buried there, and some of them also buried in Rampart Cemetery. And then, of course, the usual smattering of British, Canadian and other soldiers as well. So just a lovely place. Again, on a summer's evening, it's, it's really a wonderful spot to be. So take some time in the cemetery. Make sure you sign the visitor's book in the, near, the, near the main gate. And then we're going to head out that gate. We're going to walk back down to the Lille Gate. We're going to turn left and we're going to walk up the road back towards the main square, back into the heart of Ypres. So it's not very far. It's, it's only about a kilometre or less. We'll be back in the main square uh, of Ypres. What we're going to do now is we're going to walk, continue walking directly across the square. We're going to go under an archway through the Cloth Hall and we're going to come out facing a magnificent building on the other side of the car park, which is St. Martin's Cathedral. St. Martin's Cathedral was the other prominent building in Ypres before the war. It was built at about the same time as the Cloth Hall and and just showed the wealth and the prosperity of the town, this beautiful, huge cathedral. It's absolutely massive. And it's got cloisters that go all around the back of it. And during the war, these or the early days of the war, these were used to billet troops, uh, when they needed to find as much space as they possibly could to house troops in and around Ypres. Uh, and so they used to billet troops in the cloisters. But that all ended on the 12th of August, 1915, when shells struck the cloisters. They collapsed and about 20 British soldiers were killed. And so they no longer, uh, after that date, they no longer used the cloisters or indeed really any of the buildings in Ypres to billet troops. And troops were held in, in areas much further back behind the lines. And so the the beautiful 13th century cathedral has been rebuilt and again bears the scars of shelling from the first world war and so it's slightly different there's a there's a beautiful needle top spire on top of the cathedral now that wasn't there during the war the spire during the war was was square shaped and not the beautiful needle point so they made some slight differences to the building but it's mostly the same as it was during the war and as the soldiers knew it or at least they knew the ruin of the cathedral as they would march past this area so well worth going inside it's a beautiful european cathedral um, light a candle. Uh, it's a lovely spot. So it's a, it's a Catholic cathedral. Go inside and, and pay your respects. Have a look at the stained glass windows, which tell the story of fighting in the Ypres salient. And also look inside again for marks on the masonry, which show the, where the building was destroyed by shellfire during the First World War. When we're finished in St. Martin's Cathedral, leave by the main doors, turn right, and then right again and, and duck around behind the cathedral because there's something quite special there. There's a chapel or at least there was a chapel there before the First World War, which was never rebuilt after the war. So there's the the shell of an old chapel, and you can walk down the stairs now and stand in this ruined shell and get an idea of, again, just the the, the horrendous nature of the fighting that destroyed the entire town. But also immediately behind the cathedral is something that I really like to look at, which is a collection. It's a bit weird. It's, it's, It's a very strange collection of statues, parts of pillars, stones, that were too badly damaged to be reincorporated into the building of the cathedral. And so there's really just a display of them out in the, in, in the garden behind the cathedral. And it's quite extraordinary. Headless saints and shattered bits of masonry and, and pillars that were never, never reconstructed when the church was rebuilt. And again, just these little touch points, these little tangible moments which link us with the history. That's what it's all about. That's why we visit battlefields. We visit battlefields to link our modern era with the history of what went on there, to connect on a very human level with what went on. And if there was nothing to see, there would be no point going to the battlefields. We could just read a book or watch a documentary or listen to a podcast. But there are things to see. And and when we see these shattered bits of masonry left over from the cathedral, again, that's time travel. It casts us back to the First World War. You can run your hands along these bits of shattered material and just think about the violence that, that, that created this damage to these structures. It's really quite extraordinary. So I always look for those little touch points, whether it be a cemetery, damage to buildings like this one, a German pillbox, whatever it is, it's important to find these little connections because that's really what brings history to life. We're now going to leave St. Martin's Cathedral and walk back past the cathedral. We're going to cross the road and we're going to walk towards a small chapel on the corner. Now, this is not a Catholic chapel. This is a Church of England and this is St. George's Memorial Church. And St. George's Church tells a very interesting story about two distinct groups of people who were in need of religious sustenance in the years immediately following the war. It was built in the 1920s to serve British people. That's why it's Church of England. And two distinct groups of people. Firstly, 
there was a large British population in Ypres who were helping to rebuild the town. So St. George's Church was for them to come and pray and, and hold regular services. A lot of British men in particular came back. They could have been ex-servicemen or people who simply came over to work and help rebuilding the town. A lot of them married local girls and therefore maintained that wonderful connection between Britain and Ypres that had existed for centuries before then. So a lot of the families in the town are descended from uh, men who came over in the immediate post-war years and ended up marrying local girls and, and never leaving the, the beautiful town of Ypres. And I must say, it sounds like a wonderful thing to me to live in that town, marry a beautiful local girl and never leave. It is really a very special part of the world. And so these families came and worshipped in the, in the chapel, but also it was very important to another group of people, the pilgrims that I mentioned earlier. These were British families coming over to walk the ground and find the grave of their lost son or his name on a great memorial like the Menin Gate Memorial. I say British because it was mostly only British people that could afford to do this because if we think about the Commonwealth countries, if we think about how far flung the nations were, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, India, South Africa, these places were a long way away. They're still a long way away from Belgium, but they were a very long way away in the 1920s. And it wasn't just the cost of getting there. Of course, it was expensive. And you can all look at statistics about how how much it cost in a, the equivalent of a, a year's salary to, to get on a ship and to sail that long. But the other significant thing was the time. If it took six weeks to sail to Europe from Australia, for example, what working man or family in that time could afford to take six weeks each way? So that's 12 weeks plus a month. You know, it, It's a trip of three, four, five months it would take to get to Europe. No working family in the 1920s, very few in fact, could take the time to allocate five months to go to Europe to find the grave of their lost son. So what that means is that the vast majority of Commonwealth graves were never visited by the families. And so it's really significant when we do it today, when you stand in a cemetery, when you read those names on the Menin Gate Memorial, the other great memorials to the missing, you are completing a pilgrimage that the families never got to do. So never underestimate the importance of that. And I, that's why I'm always so grateful when I take people on a tour. You now spending your hard-earned dollars traveling all that way to Europe simply to pay your respects to men who died a century ago is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And you are completing that legacy for a family that never got to do it. So if you've done it, thank you very much. It's a wonderful thing you've done for families that you've never met. Uh, and if you haven't done it, you should certainly do it in the future because it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. So... It was different for British people, obviously. British people could jump on a ferry and come across in half a day and be in Belgium. They could do a day trip to Belgium if they wanted to. So so the majority of British families had the opportunity to come and visit the graves or the names on memorials of their lost sons, which would just be a, a tragic, tragic journey to make. And several families came regularly. They, they'd regularly come over to Belgium or, or to France and visit the grave of their lost son. And this was a church for them as well. This was a church where they could come and after they'd spent the day out on the battlefields, they could come and pay their respects at St. George's Memorial Church. And really a wonderful thing. And what happened was to pay for the church, families contributed money and they would do so in the name of a lost soldier. So what you now have is St. George's Memorial Chapel has become a First World War memorial in its own right because just about every feature of the chapel was paid for by a family or an organisation or a soldier's league, and they left their mark there. They would put a plaque there telling you who they commemorate. So now when you go inside, the walls are just covered in plaques dedicated to various individuals, various units, telling wonderful stories. Each of the individual pews has a plaque on it in memory, memory of a soldier who was killed in the salient. So it's just a wonderful place to go to remember these these lost men. There's a lot of uh, flags of units that served in the Ypres salient. And once the flag was retired, when it was no, no longer able to be used and carried in marches or, or displayed in the headquarters, they were donated to the chapel. So there were flags from battalions and units and, and military organizations and nations who served in the Ypres salient. So St. George's Memorial Chapel is now just a wonderful place to go and and pay your respects, but also see the memorials to so many soldiers. So that there's thousands and thousands of memorials. There's a number of Australian ones in there, New Zealand ones. Again, all the Commonwealth countries, obviously a huge number of British ones there. Um, some pretty impressive memorials. The Canadians paid for the heating system. Uh, so there's a, there's a plaque to them, but there's just a wonderful range of memorials. So you can spend a lot of time reading all of those plaques and, and getting lost. It's a quiet and beautiful place and a lovely place to go. So that's St. George's Memorial Chapel. Uh, interestingly as well, the uh, Mr. Knott, uh, K-N-O-T-T, was a major benefactor of the chapel. And the tower, the, the spire 
at the front of the chapel. There's a plaque there commemorating him and the money that he gave to, to help the church be built. But there's something interesting, and this is probably a nice way to end our tour of Ypres, there's something interesting in the nearby Ypres Reservoir Cemetery, which we haven't visited on this walk, but certainly you, you can visit. It's not far away from St. George's Memorial Chapel, Ypres Reservoir Cemetery. There's a couple of very special burials there which are associated with Mr. Knott, who, who helped pay for the chapel. Uh, and those are the two Knott brothers, Captain Henry Knott and Major James Knott, uh, who were both British soldiers. And they have a very interesting story to tell, and this is probably a nice way to end our tour in front of these graves. So Henry uh, was killed in September 1915 while fighting in the Ypres salient. But his brother James was killed on the 1st of July 1916 at Free Corps on the Somme, on the, the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the 1st of July 1916, that that day when so many British men were killed fighting on the Somme. Now, the Somme is more than 120 kilometres away from Ypres. It's a very, very long way away. And the Imperial War Graves Commission, later the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, had a very strict policy. They did not move graves around. If, if you were separated, if two brothers had been killed and they were separated, they were not moved. They were buried on the ground where they fell. But an exception was made in this case. So Sir James Knott was their father, as I said, a major benefactor of the chapel. And apparently he lobbied the Imperial War Graves Commission uh, to have his sons buried together. And so James Knott was removed from the grave where he'd been buried in Free Corps on the Somme and he was brought up here and buried alongside his brother in Ypres Reservoir Cemetery. So the two Knott brothers now lie side by side in the cemetery. This is incredibly rare. This is the only place I've seen it on the Western Front. It's probably unique that two brothers were moved to be together, buried side by side. But now if you go to Ypres, Ypres Reservoir Cemetery and you go to uh, row B of plot five, you can see the two Knott brothers buried side by side and uh, united in death as they had been in life. And that really sums up the sentiment of the Epa salient, just the, the, the notion that Epa has not forgotten. Remembrance is so important to the town of Epa. You see it in the restaurants, you see it in the souvenir shops, you see it in the memorials, you see it in the wonderful museums. Everywhere in the town is just remembrance, this spirit of not forgetting what was sacrificed to bring the town to freedom and, and the wonderful town that we see today. So it's a really wonderful place. This has been a brief walk around the town. You can do this in a few hours, the walk that I've described, and just a really wonderful place to visit. And after we finished our walk, after we've left the chapel, I would suggest wandering back to the main square on a, on a warm summer's evening and sitting in one of the beautiful outdoor cafes, ordering a, a large, cold Belgian beer, maybe having a steak and chips or a Flemish stew or eel is the other speciality. Belgian mussels, there's just wonderful food to be had. And just sit there on the square and watch people walking by. It's a wonderful place to just contemplate the wonderful things you've seen during the day and the memories of the men who walked past you on these same cobblestones, many of them never to return. It's a wonderful town, Ypres. I strongly encourage you to get over there, walk the ground. If you've done it before, head back there. Come with me on a tour. I love taking people to the town of Ypres. It's a beautiful place. And I hope you've enjoyed this walking tour around the town of Ypres. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast and visit livinghistorytv.com for more great history content.